copyright notice. You are free to download and copy this work in audio format for replay in any audio or video mode, and I encourage you to do so and enjoy and learn. You may redistribute it in a non-commercial fashion, that is, not-for-profit directly or indirectly. You may not sell or seek to profit from this publication in part or in whole, nor may you translate it into any written format for any purpose. Thank you. Chapter 25 of the e-novel, survival novel, When the Walls Came Tumbling Down, as read by the author, Garçon. Sitting on the comfortable chair in Johnson's bungalow, John Casolo smiled, pleased mightily with himself. While he had lost the battle, he hadn't lost the war. Nobody trifled with him and ever had gotten away with it, ever. He was important and he knew people, very powerful and influential people, senators and congressmen, as well as the powers that were behind them, international bankers and financiers, all in his back pocket and with direct access themselves to no less than the President of the United States, as well as the heads of other nations. He would have his compound back, yes, he had lost a small stash of gold, but that was a pittance to what he could lay his hands on, what he knew he would make in the future. He had already worked out a very elaborate scheme for that. While the world focused on rebuilding and reestablishment, he and his friends would make sure this time they got absolute control of the real power, the power to print and supply money. The government would need capital and financing. He would provide the illusion of giving them just what they needed. He would use his innate ability to raise money to manipulate markets and create the illusion of even more money. It was a clever trick and although it had failed and caused the current crisis, most people were not aware of how fractional reserve banking and, more importantly, how fractional reserve markets worked. In essence, it was built upon the illusion that if someone had a dollar, there was 10 more that could be printed and loaned out. The man with the license to print the money would be able to dictate the value of the dollars. Dry up the money supply and the value of the dollar increased. Increase the flow and the value would drop. Simple, but if you knew when the money value was going to change, you would do more than profit, you would rule. This had been the system in use before and the crash had come from people finding out what was going on and just refusing to lend money to the scheme or to trust it. Many had simply objected because they saw how much was being made and how little they got of the action in return. This time, though, John and his friends would keep a tighter rein on things. This time also, they would not be so generous with those peasants out there. The new government, the one he and his friends at the Lair envisioned, was an oligarchy, in fact, but he preferred to think of themselves as the new aristocracy. They would quietly control things from behind the scenes, a hidden hand. They did not care if the peasants hung on to symbolic illusions of freedom. At the end of the day, John and his friends would own everything. The game was quite simple, really. With John and his friends in control of the money supply, they would create more money by fiat, by decree, by nothing more than saying so. That the money was created was of little value would not be obvious to the peasants. They would get a false sense the economy was doing well and begin buying on credit. Every dollar they loaned, John and his friends would profit from. Never mind that the dollars loaned had no actual value. The only value in fact would be on the money paid that represented real labor and the creation of goods. They would let this condition go on for several years and then manufacture a crisis. This would in turn force a tightening of the money supply which would cause people to default on their loans. This meant all the equity, all the payments made on land and homes and other durable goods would be forfeited when the banks went into foreclosure or receivership. The disaffected peasants fell for it time and again over the last centuries and never seemed to learn. Indeed, many of the inhabitants of the Eagle's Lair had been part of this system in the past and were more than eager to institute it in the future. Their compliant senators and congressmen had given the green light already, indicating the usual percentage of the profits would be given to them, of course. It would be business as usual, but now with a new twist. 
there would be no more oversight from the peasants. They would have to take what was offered or else. John loved the idea of hard times. It made it so much easier to change the rules of the game. He would pay Johnson the gold, but the fool had no idea who he was dealing with. A pawn never took the king, not in this chess game anyway. Johnson was less than a pawn too. He wasn't even a player, just a stooge. After the release force came, he would have him arrested, the gold taken back from him, and would have him put out of the lair to a certain death. John smiled when he thought of that one. Casola would be there when it happened, too. He would make sure that he stuck the knife in and twisted it around and watched as Johnson was paid back in full. Peasants like him needed to learn their place. His curiosity about what was happening to his compound got the better of him, and so he decided to take a walk around. Checking himself in the mirror, he thought that he looked a little too distinguished with his hair coiffed neatly, and so found a hat in Johnson's closet. How pedestrian, but necessary. Satisfied, he smirked, and then went out the front door. He bit back his anger as he saw these ruffian-looking bikers walking around, and worse, many of the servants with them, talking and eagerly showing them how the place ran. Where was their loyalty? They should have fought these people. Instead, they were actually treating them like benefactors. These people, too, would be made to pay for their treason. There would be some definite changes made when he got control again as well. For one thing, these bungalows were far too nice. Apparently, it had given the servants ideas, made them a little too uppity. They needed a taste of poverty to make them grateful for their benefactors. Out of the corner of his eye, he noted a man walking his way. It was that insolent and incompetent waiter. What was his name? Peter or was it Philip? He pulled the cap down low over his eyes and tried to avoid the man, but he apparently had been recognized. As much as he hated to do it, now he would have to bribe this man as well. Well, well, look here, it's Mr. Casolo. The sarcasm on the title Mr. was sneering, contemptuous, vile, and wholly unacceptable. He stood addressing him with his hands on his hips, standing now about ten feet away and talking loud. People were stopping and looking. Others began to assemble. He had to act quickly. Quiet, you fool, he quipped, but could see that a crowd was quickly forming now. What do you want? How much? He pulled his ball cap down and tried to turn and make his way back to Johnson's place, but the way was blocked by a woman. He looked up and saw it was the maid. The look in her eyes should have warned him of what came next. She kicked him between his legs and he doubled over as she jumped on his back and began savagely clawing at his face. He threw her to the ground and kicked her savagely in the stomach before someone knocked him to the ground. Soon he was being kicked and beaten mercilessly as he tried to get into the fetal position to protect himself. All right, break it up, an authoritative voice spoke, and people stopped kicking him. One person, though, delivered a quick final kick to his ribs from behind and then stepped over him. What's this all about? The man was huge, bearded and carrying a rifle, one of the bikers. Casolo got up slowly and said, I, I don't know, these crazy people attacked me and I, before he could finish, Philip spoke, he's one of the members, man, he's in disguise. Interesting, the man said and then asked, what's your name? Casolo thought and then said, Robert, Robert Johnson, I'm a technician. I helped design this place. He had to talk swiftly now, had to be bold. Can we speak in private, he said. There is something urgent I need to tell you. He looked carefully into the man's eyes and could see that he appeared to be buying it. He had heard these bikers were working class men, stooges, not very bright, but at the moment, quite dangerous. He felt certain he could manipulate this man easily. The man took him to the side and told the others to move on. Perfect, John thought, and he laid out a not too elaborate story about a plot by the servants to sabotage the place. He implicated Philip and Johnson as well as the maid and half a dozen others just for good measure. The story sounded convincing and he was sure it would get him in front of the decision maker. Never make a deal with the workers. First rule in business, always find the man in the corner office. The man said, okay, follow me. What's your name again? What an oaf, John thought, and so he gave it again. Richard Johnson, he said impatiently. The man kept walking beside him and said, that's interesting. 
because I thought you said it was Robert, Robert Johnson a second ago. Cosolo could not believe the man was so stupid. If he knew, why did he ask? The man began to quiz him on his duties, to which he answered that he was a technician. So you build things then. Cosolo was getting impatient and hoped they could get to the decision maker soon. This oaf was tiring and not too bright, typical of these working class types. Yes, I work with my hands, he said, rolling his eyes. Really? The man stopped and said, let me see your hands, Richard, or is it Robert? The way he stood with his shoulders square told John he had best comply, and so he held him up. Nice pedicure, Bob. You don't mind if I call you Bob, do you? Bob, the man said, then ordered, turn them over. Let's see the palms. Casolo failed to see the point of this, but did so. No blisters, not even a scar. Pedicure, too. I smell a rich boy. The words rich boy stabbed into him like an accusation, for they were followed by an evil and menacing look from the man. Now he would have to deal with this man, too. Cut him in. Bribe him. He had tried to avoid it. Not a good business move, but now it was necessary, like having to bribe a secretary in order to see the boss. Look, I can make you a rich man, a very rich man, he began. The man seemed nonplussed and regarded his nails for a second, cleaning one with his teeth, which Casolo found repulsive. I have gold and precious stones, name your price. He would simply give this man Johnson's share and cut him out. Too easy. All he needed now was to get past this moment and get his hands on that satellite phone and then just hide or hang on until the cavalry arrived. The man thought for a minute and then, without showing any indication of what he was thinking, said, okay, take me to your stash. Casolo smiled and said, not so fast. We need to come to terms first. Quickly, he laid out his offer, the same one he had made with Johnson, essentially get him into the safe, get him his satellite phone, and he would get 200 pounds of gold. The man said, okay, Bob, let's go. They walked swiftly to John's old house. Along the way, John smirked. He was going to win, after all. Not the way he had hoped that morning would turn out, but not bad either. At the house, he punched in the six-digit code, entered the home, and told the man, wait here. The man nodded in agreement, and Casolo trotted back to the hinged bookcase, swung it aside, and opened the safe. Inside, he was alarmed. Johnson had been here apparently already, and had taken a large quantity of the gold and gems, but worse, he had gotten the satellite phone. His head spun and he was lost for a moment, but only for a moment. He would get this man outside to get the phone back from Johnson, as well as the gold and gems. Johnson probably had them all at his place by now. When he came back into the living room, the man was gone, but there were three other men standing in his place. One man was obviously in charge. His manner, his bearing, all spoke of the fact that he was the decision maker. One of the other men was a strange, bespectacled older man, and another was a towering hulk with a fierce look in his eyes that reminded him a lot of that insolent security commander who had cut and run. Understand you want to negotiate, the man said after a moment, then added, Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive my manners. Can I offer you something to drink from my bar? The man knew, now, knew that this had once been his house, and he was goading him. John would play along for now. All he needed to do was survive until the cavalry arrived, until he could get in touch with Johnson. Can we speak alone, John began, and the man said, No, thanks. If you got something to say to me, these men can hear it too. Not what he wanted to hear, but it would have to do, so he continued. Okay, let me pay you the compliment of being direct. I can make you all wealthy men. Danny walked across the marble foyer near the curved staircase and banister and held his arms wide in great flourish. What could you offer a man who has all this, John? He added, the last indicating he knew exactly who he was speaking to. I recognized your picture from the papers, John. You're quite the creative financier. The way he said financier was not very polite, although John was surprised at how eloquent this man was. The man went to the humidor and got out a cigar and offered one to John. He was feeling ill, though, and refused. Regarding the cigar in his hand, he picked up the cigar cutter and trimmed the end off as he said, I thought I was bad with my meth labs and smuggling, guns and dope, killing my competitors, but you, sir, you take the cake. 
He said this almost with admiration, and John was not sure where he was going. My sister worked for one of your companies. She told me how you bought them out, laid them off, stole their retirement and pensions, and then your bank evicted them from their homes. He then used the butane lighter to light fire on the end before putting it in his mouth and puffing on it. The other two men stood arms folded, smirking and eyeing John with evil intent. He tried to ignore them, tried to focus on what was happening right now. He had to get control of this situation somehow. I can take you right now to several million in gold and gems, John began, and Danny cut him off. John, 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 don't you know what's yours is mine and what's mine is mine? The other men laughed at this and then he continued, offer me something I don't already have. Very well then, he began. When things turn around, there will be fortunes made, he paused. How would you like to have your own company, your own business, be millionaires? The man's eyebrows raised and he turned and looked at his friends. Well, I never thought much about it. How about you guys? The skinny man said, I always wanted my own company. Can I own Microsoft? Mike said, I want to own a firearms company. I want to make guns. The men were mocking him and this was making him even more angry. John, open the safe, Danny said tiredly. Now it was time to negotiate. We have a deal then, John said. The bigger one said, no, John, what you have is you being given an order. Open up or else. John smiled, crossed his arms and said, you will never get that safe open without my help. Danny puffed on the cigar, turned to the wire and said in mock surprise, is that true? The wire quickly responded, nope. Too easy. The safes here are all Diebold types. Hard to crack and pick, but they can be drilled out in about an hour. The mechanics here tell me they even have the tungsten drill bits we need. They will be drilling out the other houses on the street later on, in fact. I can set up a drill press to run horizontally, see? They have a really nice one down in the shop. You should see. It's heavy duty, made in Germany. All I need is... Danny cut him off and said, Okay, yes, good, yes, got it. The wire was smart, but he could lay your mind to waste with technical details. About an hour. The wire added dejectedly. John knew he was running out of cards to play. Well, John, Danny said, blowing a nice smoke ring into the air, it looks like our business here is about finished. He drew out his pistol, cocked the hammer, and aimed it directly at John's head. The look in his eyes told him that the man was not bluffing. Light Fighters I took 16 of the best from the 24 men Bill had assigned, younger and more agile of the group. We would be on foot, moving fast, but I also needed to know that they could move out of the way. There was little time to do more than make a sand table and explain the concept of the operation. I had 14 men and two women with me, and most of them had bolt-action rifles and could shoot them very well. Paul and I each had AR-15s, and there was an SKS and an AK-47 in our element. I broke the people into two-person teams. One would shoot, the other would provide cover and spot the targets. We would attempt to engage from 300 yards and I anticipated how the vehicles would array themselves to fire on the dummy targets. They would not stay on the dummy targets for long though and we needed to act fast. We had to move into position when the word came that they were moving against us. Someone suggested we attack them in their camp but I nixed that. The maximum effective range of their crew serve weapons far exceeded ours. If we got within sniper range, they would pick us apart, especially if they had thermal imaging devices. With the enemy engaging targets to their front, we would approach from their blind side. After they deployed, their foot soldiers to sweep into the woods. Because their foot soldiers would be mostly to their front, they would not feel the need to keep an element back to protect their armor from an infantry attack, or so I hoped. We would advance into position as quickly and quietly as possible. I needed to get us to within 300 yards, but also to keep us near some cover if possible. That close would mean we needed to work fast, and if they left a flank security element with the vehicles, we would have to take them out first. I was not too sure on this point because while the bulk of their force appeared to be a disorganized and poorly trained mob, the rest seemed to be professional soldiers, some of whom may have some real talent. I explained the scheme of maneuver and the concept of the operation as clearly and concisely as possible. Six teams would have a single gun truck to take down. 
They were to shoot the gunner and anticipate the driver would try to man the gun next and to stay on target and wait for him and shoot him as he tried to man the gun. Sounds simple, but I knew how hard it would be. The remaining six people would man the flanks and prevent us from being ambushed ourselves. When I finished, I then asked for questions and had a few about the vehicles, the turrets and how many people in each. We then broke into our elements and began practicing. I took us on a short patrol around the firehouse to make sure we were comfortable operating as a team and an element, and then told everyone to go home and get some sleep. In a few hours, we would assemble or sooner if the attack came. I wanted us to move through the woods and be in position no later than 2400. It would take us at least two hours to move tactically from the firehouse to there, and that would give us another two hours latitude to prepare for the coming attack. I anticipated they would hit us at dawn during BMNT or before morning nautical twilight and we would want to be in position before they began their move up so they would bypass us as we sat in static positions. Blood money. Danny smiled almost perversely at the man who was obviously scared. He wouldn't shoot the man here. Not like this. For one thing, the blood would get all over the house, and for another, he didn't want the rest of the people on the compound to get shaken up any more than they already were. He was focused on the mission at hand. Mission first. Still, he had to do something with John Casolo. He would be trouble if he let him live. He would let his fate be decided by the workers, by the people who had run this place. He smiled as he thought of the righteous justice in that. Slowly, he released the hammer on the pistol and put it back in the holster on his leg. The smile on the man's face said that he thought he had won a negotiation point, and he immediately began speaking nervously. Look, I know this place like the back of my hand. You're lead me, he said. The wire interjected. Actually, we don't. We have everything we need already, including the blueprint schematics and the technicians to work them, many times over, in fact. He said this last, looking with disdain at Casolo. Okay, enough chit-chat. Here's the deal, Danny said, plopping down on the leather recliner. He and the wire sat smiling at each other for a second as the chair just kept sinking. Danny blew some more smoke pensively, then said, I'm not going to shoot you, John. John seemed relieved at that, but something in the man's tone told him that he wasn't in the clear just yet. I'm going to let your people out there decide what to do with you instead. Danny noticed the man's face turned an even paler shade of gray as the blood left it. Apparently, he thought, the guy must have been a real charmer, but the bruises on his face already spoke of the fact that he was probably hated and quite thoroughly, too. Danny got up, motioned to the front door with his head, and said, Lead the way! Back down to the workers' houses. John could not believe this was happening. The big man came over and cuffed him on the side of the head and said, Move! He began walking out the door as if in a dream. How could all this be happening? He had built this place. Now he was being handed over to be beaten or worse. As they walked, people began to follow and gather around. When they had gotten to the servants area, Danny raised his hand for silence and the conversation and noise tapered off slowly and then it was silent. Folks, you know this man. I'm going to leave it up to you what we do with him. He paused for a second to let that sink in. I figure if he's a good man, you'll take him into one of your houses. There were murmurs and a few angry words and a curse. And if he's not a good man, well, I'll let you folks decide that one too. The maid spoke up first with fire in her eyes. I had to sleep with him to keep my job. Several other women shouted that they too had been forced to do the same. Soon the crowd began to shout and jeer. Someone threw something at John, narrowly missing his head. He ducked and his eyes were now wide in fear. A familiar man's voice spoke. I say we put him out. The speaker then came forward. It was Philip, the waiter. Everyone was looking at the man and he spoke. He always threatened us with being put out. I say we do it to him. There was a hubbub of conversation and soon people were shouting their approval. Danny raised his hands and then said, all right, that's it. Out the south gate with him then. Rough hands grabbed John Casolo, one man cuffing him on the side of the head. A woman spat on him angrily and kicked at him in the seat of his pants. John stumbled along, half dragged, half pushed, and kicked toward the south gate. Philip yelled, don't send him yet, I have something to give him. 
John had no idea what that could be, but guessed it was not good. At the gate, a member of the Fallen was standing guard, and the crowd pushed Casolo against the fence and began to kick and spit on him. Danny let them have their fun. He frankly didn't care if they beat him to death right there on the spot. The man in his ilk had robbed and raped countless millions of people in the world and deserved every bad thing that happened to him. Philip came running up with a coffee can, and when he got near John, he pulled the top off and threw animal blood all over him. The blood had come from the butcher's shop. Wouldn't want the wolves out there to work too hard finding you, John, the man said derisively. Wolves. John remembered hearing of them in these woods. He tried to remember what he knew of wolves. Suddenly, though, the gate was open and John ran out as quickly as possible as people swung at him and pelted him with rocks. He ran quickly out of range of them, and soon all he heard were their voices fading behind. He jogged smoothly and evenly across the fields and into the woods. He stood at the tree line and shouted, I'll be back, and he would. He would be back to have all of them kicked out or maybe just shot. Turning around now, he headed due south. He knew there was a hard surface road about 14 miles away. Once there, he would head back to civilization and hopefully to the hidden government location, which wasn't hidden from him at all. He knew exactly where, and more importantly, how to gain access. There were wolves in the forest. He knew this, but he was not afraid. They were supposedly more afraid of humans than anything else, and he would bluff them. He saw a stick that would serve as a good club and picked that up and ran with it. Years of playing tennis had kept him in fairly good shape, and he could keep this pace up for a good distance. His biggest challenge tonight, though, would be staying warm. The blood on him was sticky, congealing to his skin, making him itch a bit. That waiter would pay for this, he vowed, and his own blood began to boil. He would get the senator to send back a strike force of some sort, and he would personally see to it that all of them were executed or at least put out. He relished the idea of watching that man Danny squirm or paying them back a hundred times over for this, for all that they had done to him. As the sun set, he felt assured that he would now make it, only seven miles more to the road, perhaps. He thought he saw something off to his left. He paused for a second and looked. There it was, a shadowy form like a dog, and it was padding this way. He called out to it, good, a dog. A dog would help him keep the wolves away, safety in numbers. Wolves were supposed to be afraid of numbers, he remembered. Soon other dogs began to join this one, and with a sickening lurch in the pit of his stomach, he realized they were not dogs at all, but wolves, a pack of them, hunting, hunting him coming for him right at him, heads alert, watching him intently. He ran to a nearby tree and tried to scramble up, but he was too weak. The blood must have told him, them, that he was hurt because they seemed to show no fear. Terror gripped his very soul, a horror overtaking him as he heard the snarling of the wolves gaining on him. Suddenly, something caught him in the hamstring, a sharp nip followed by another. Powerful jaws clamped onto his calves, and then he fell headlong into the pine needles as more mouths were biting at his arms and shoulders. Turning onto his back to swing feebly with the club, a wolf slammed him in the chest with his paws and began biting and tearing at his face and neck. The ferociousness of the attack shook him, made his body go limp with weakness. The relentless manner in which the wolf went after him without mercy as he cried out in pain. The biting was now more intense, more fierce, all over his body. He slipped into unconsciousness, his last thoughts on this mortal earth being fear and terror of being eaten alive. In a few minutes, it was all over, and the corpse was dismembered by the hungry pack of wolves who tore him limb from limb and then fought over the pieces. The body of John Casola would never really be found. The animals of the forest would see to that. Through the night. We assembled in the eerie moonlit night, most straggling in by groups of ones and twos. The defensive forces were also assembling, and I saw a couple embracing in the dark near the big maple tree just south of the firehouse. I looked a little closer and smiled. It was Linda and Kevin, and they appeared oblivious to the world. Her arms were around his neck, his arms were around her waist, and they kissed passionately. 
At around 2200, I could see everyone was present, and I had them line up quickly and inspected them. Earlier, I had instructed all members of the guard on how to make a ghillie suit, essentially a netted suit that made a person resemble a bush, or like Sasquatch. I told them that tonight, they would need to bring theirs along, and some were quite good, others not so much. I held the inspections mostly, though, because troops going into battle need the assurance that an older veteran has looked them over and said they're ready. I made corrections to their camouflage and had each person turn around for me, jumped up and down, and then I inspected their weapons to make sure bolts were lubed and that we had no noise making jingles and jangles. When this was done, I gave them all time to reapply camouflage. We would all need it. Before we stepped off the line, I let Bill know we were leaving and which direction we were headed. He seemed lost in thought at the map, sipping his coffee before he turned and shook my hand, saying, Good hunting. I said the same to him, gave him a hug, and we left, neither sure he would see the other again in this life. Outside, I went to Paul and said, You take six, I'll take point. Then to the squad, just like rehearsal folks, only enough interval to see the other person hand and arm signals, no closer. A few okays, and we were up and moving fast. There was a thick fog that lingered over the river, making it look like something out of a horror movie. I half expected a sea serpent to rise up and eat us as we crossed the bridge in a tactical column, then skirted to the left. About a, mile up, <clears throat> about a mile up, we encountered evidence of the work done by the defensive platoon. They would maneuver into one of three lines of prepared defensive positions when the observation post let Bill know which avenue the impending attack was coming on. When that happened, my teams would skirt around the left flank and position ourselves about 300 meters from our shooting positions and hold in the cover and concealment of the huge drainage ravine that was choked out with undergrowth. When the attack forces committed, we would let them begin engaging targets before we snuck in on the other flank and hopefully took them out. I knew that 17 people attacking the gun trucks from the flank would not be a slam dunk. Knew that we would encounter difficulty and take casualties, but also knew it had to be done. I told everyone a final word as I individually set the people into a small defensive perimeter while we held up. Don't take stupid chances. I want you to kill them, not kill yourself. Most of the troops seemed quite scared, and well, they should be. Attacking six machine guns was nothing to sneeze at. I told the people that we would be on 50-50 alert. Half would sleep, half would stay awake. Sleeping by buddy teams, but no snoring, no poncho liners. Most didn't sleep, and I joined them in staying awake in anticipation despite the fatigue my body felt. Guidons. Ox looked at Mitchell for a second in the dark moonlit light before saying, okay, give the word to move out. Mitchell just looked at him for a second and said, no then went back to scanning the groups of troops and speed bumps as they got somewhat organized for the attack. Mitchell had given up on any sort of advanced tactics from the shock troops, so named because he and Ox would be shocked if they actually did more than just pin down the home guard troops. If that was all they did, even that would work. The gun trucks would do the bulk of the job and go over the bridge. Once across and inside the town, the people there would lose the will to fight. They had to take the bridges first though, and after that, it was a piece of cake. Because of this, he would march the shock troops up the road following the gun trucks who would be staggered in convoy formation. Mitchell had decided he would lead the ground force because none of the people there could do it. Even so, the advance would be very basic stuff. Get on line at the roadside and follow Mitchell into the forest, trying not to bunch up. Hopefully they would come out on the other side and bypass any resistance the town might put up. He had checked the map and seen that this area was pretty big and there were not enough people to cover it all. Because the people had not sent out a preemptive strike or snipers against them, he felt certain they were undetected. These backwood types probably didn't have a listening post or observation post out either, and that too would be a good thing. Mitchell would be in the center of the line, and he had PFC Boudreau and Specialist Ferguson on the left and right, far ends of the element. On the road, they would use their lensatic compasses and shoot an azimuth, 
Their job was to keep the element from drifting too much left or right and to follow their azimuth. All were assigned to not go past these two men left or right. Mitchell would lead from the middle and also help guide with his compass. This left 10 soldiers to head up the convoy and man the crew serve weapons. Mitchell had picked an additional 14 bodies from the shock troops to use as drivers and additional crew. The guns had to stay up in the fight and Shamron as well as the ox knew this. Mitchell thought of putting Maria on one of these vehicles just to make the ox sweat and then realized he would need the oaf a bit longer. Soon though, before Saint Quentin, he would make his move and put that slob out of his misery. Mitchell turned to look at the ox and wondered if he was even a sergeant. Probably not. Probably some PFC brig rat from the way he carried on. He was sorry he had taken this turn, followed this man, and wished that now he was back on active duty somewhere. At least that way, at the end of the day, you wouldn't get much, but you would get something, even if it was just a ribbon or a medal. Okay, now we go, he said to Ox, emphasizing the point that he truly was no longer in charge. Ox hand reached for his rifle, but then he thought better of it. Mitchell raised an eyebrow because he caught that hand twitch, and Ox noted this as well, and how quickly the man had reacted. He would have to deal with him later, when he got the drop on him. Hopefully, though, he would be killed in the woods. Ox got into the second vehicle command seat and put on his headset. Mitchell and his people were already moving out on foot, and they would follow when Mitchell crossed the FIBA, or forward edge of the battle area, which would be the main road. From there, his people would deploy essentially in one large, creeping wave through the woods. Mitchell had tried to get the people to work in team formations, fire team rushes and things, but it was a disaster, and he decided it would be better to deal with a slightly less tactical formation of a wide, creeping line than bounding teams. Those teams would probably shoot each other in the back accidentally. Situation was not ideal, but was feasible. They would have the advantage of the heavy gun trucks flanking the defenders, and that would make their defenses untenable. Mitchell's plan was to be on such a wide front that the bulk of his forces would simply be able to sweep around the edges of the defenders, or, if they were widely dispersed in these woods, to simply flow through the middle of them. He estimated that they would have a three-to-one advantage in personnel over the defenders, which would give them a one-to-one -one combat ratio fighting against the defenders. The gun trucks flanking their position would be the decisive maneuver that won the fight. All his people had to do was pin down the defenders. They reached the FIBA in about half an hour and Mitchell pushed the people into the wood line before calling a halt and then signaling back to the ox on the radio. Wolf 6, this is Badger 6, checkpoint 1 over. Ox came back shortly with Badger 6, Wolf 6, Roger out. In the distance, he could hear the growling whine of the Humvees as they approached ahead down the road and into position. His people would hold position until they knew that the gun trucks were ready to engage the targets. If all went well, in about four hours, they would be standing on the other side of the river, helping themselves to what the town had to offer. Little Bird. The sky was clear, but there was a chill wind blowing as Joshua stood talking to the four other men from the town whom Leroy had picked to go with him. It was a token force at best, and Joshua suspected that this was more to placate him than anything else. Leroy had frankly tried to talk him out of going after the convoy alone. It was pure suicide. When they could see he was not going to be swayed, Leroy had announced he was going to and put his hand on his shoulder, adding, paratroopers always stick together. Three other men had volunteered to go, and Leroy had warned them of the inherent risks and was frankly hoping that Joshua might change his mind. Now, though, they could see he wasn't going to, and so the die was cast. Suddenly in the distance, they could hear the high-pitched rotors of a small helicopter moving their way fast. Joshua and Leroy exchanged incredulous glances with each other. Leroy was of a mind to hide, but Joshua had an idea. The only people flying a helicopter had to be government. Why they were flying, he didn't bother to ascertain. He made a bold decision. He ran out into the middle of the road and held his rifle over his head to show it in profile. The M4 carbine is distinctive and, when held this way, serves as a recognition signal of sorts to a helicopter flying by. 
It also shows the pilot you aren't pointing it at him, which helps when you consider he has a door gunner. His military uniform combined with the rifle he hoped would serve as recognition enough, and soon enough that helicopter came along flying in along the road as navigation. The helo flared out and then rotated to its right, which allowed the door gunner to train the 240 Golf machine gun on him. Joshua held position, though, and swallowed. This was a huge risk, and he might be signing his death warrant. Still, he had already committed, and there was nothing to do but hope and pray. The helo then turned its nose back to him, banked away, and flew a low circle before returning to hover in its original position. Joshua responded by slinging his rifle and then held both hands to his sides, then pointed them directly at the bird, indicating assumed guidance. The bird moved toward him and he guided it in to land. He motioned for Leroy and the others to hold their position as he ran to the nose of the helo. When he got close, he could see the pilots were not military, not in uniform, but one of them made a salute and the other gave him thumbs up, probably ex-military. The door gunner dismounted and eyed Joshua for a second before he stepped up and shouted in his ear, follow me, and they took off running about a hundred feet ahead of the bird. As they did this, the bird shot up into the air and sped back the way it had come. The two men looked at each other for a moment before Tim asked, who is your unit? Josh explained briefly the disbanding of the units and why he was here, and then told him about the renegade unit headed north. Tim wasn't interested in doing police call on the world. It was like swimming in a cesspool right now and suddenly getting interested in a particular piece of excrement. His mission was to get his people up to Al's house and then figure out where to go from there. Getting into a fight along the way was not on the agenda and he told Joshua as much. Joshua was clearly disappointed and Tim said, look son, take it from an old hand. Pick your battles or you won't pick very many. He thought about that for a second before he said, can't. Tim had to smile. This young soldier reminded him of himself when he was a young trooper. Still though, his mission was to get to Stockholm. Leroy and his friends came out of the woods now and approached slowly. Joshua said they were okay, that he knew them, and Tim relaxed, then asked if any of them knew a guy named Al in that town nearby. Leroy smiled and said, in fact, I was just there a few days ago. Tim asked, is this a big muscle-bound guy, former military? And Leroy said, that's him all right. He's got a cute little woman too. Tim smiled, this was definitely Al. He turned to Josh and said, look, Sergeant, I'm headed to Stockholm. Al's a buddy of mine from the army. Then he added, if that convoy you saw is headed somewhere else, my advice is you let them go. We don't have the horses to pull that wagon. Joshua seemed determined though, and Tim placated him a bit by saying, my people are coming up that road soon in a truck. You can ride along with us to the next town. Then looking at Leroy and the others, you and your friends too, but I'm not gonna help you tangle with an army convoy of gun trucks, not with my little bird and a dozen men. Joshua looked angry, no doubt, and Tim had to respect his position for that, but also had to think of his men first. In the end, the soldier got a grim look on his face and relented. He would ride ahead to the next town and Leroy would go along, but the other men would return home. Tim pulled a radio from his chest rig and called the bird back. Soon the bird and a snowplow with a machine gun mounted on it appeared and the men clambered aboard the snowplow while Tim got into the bird and it shot into the air again, scouting ahead. In the back of the truck, the men shook their hands and then sized the two newcomers up. Professional soldiers can spot one another by the way they carry their weapons and wear their gear. A sort of no-nonsense look. Clean weapon and carried casually but professionally. Josh could tell these men were pros, and one of them said, okay, Sergeant, I need you over here on the left. And to Leroy, he said with a grin, and you on the right, Airborne. He said the last because he caught a glimpse of Leroy's 173rd Airborne tattoo. The truck took off with a lurch, and soon they were speeding north towards Stockholm. Movement. The OP had spotted the ground forces earlier, and Bill had determined they would be coming in almost down the middle of the forest, and had sent the word to the defensive platoon by runner. Cynthia was dressed up in a pair of camouflage pants that Jacqueline had donated, and was acting as the runner. Behind the firehouse stood the main reserve force, and it made Bill almost weep to see it. 
There stood many of the wives and daughters of the men who were in the main defensive elements. If the main line should fail, this was it. The women had said they would rather fight than have happened to them what had happened to Linda and others. Bill couldn't blame them and hoped it wouldn't come down to that. Jacqueline had wanted to be in the main defensive force, but Al had asked her instead to join with the reserve. They would, quote, need her sword and shield, as he put it. Now the defensive forces were moving into their prepared positions, looking out ahead with binoculars and scopes on their rifles. Still nothing to be seen, but they were on edge, tense. Linda was frightened now, wondering what she had gotten herself into. Why couldn't life be simple like it was years ago when people could take vacations and have fun? She felt guilty for these thoughts as she realized all over the world and throughout history, people had tragic things happen to them. Why should she be exempt? Why should she be any different? Kevin was not afraid so much though. He was not fighting for grand ideals or patriotism or glory, or even for the town behind them, even though these were all good things. No, he would fight for something more real to him. He would fight for this woman at his side, this woman he knew that he loved. He wished she was not here, that she was somewhere far away. Instinctively, he stepped forward a bit of her as he peered through the binoculars. She stepped behind him and then wrapped her arms around him and put her head against his back and hugged him tightly. This has been chapter 25 of the e-novel survival novel, The Walls Came Tumbling Down as read by the author. Tune in next Friday for chapter 26.